you know, to everything you go through, you kind of learn from it. You know, it's like, you know, why, why am I still here? Like, what, what am I doing here? Like 12 years after that whole ordeal, I was pretty much ready to go then, you know, so now I'm always thinking like, you know, I don't want to waste my time and I don't want to waste it on foolishness. I want to waste it on stuff that's still going to be here when I'm gone. You know, and I, I have actually told my wife, I, I think people will probably discover my music after I'm gone more than now. And uh, that's okay. You know, I was talking to someone yesterday and we got to talking uh, about uh, helping other people or serving other people. You know, when, when Jesus Christ was on this planet, there was, a, I mean, he's king of kings, but there were times that he would get down and he would wash other people's feet. Uh, he humbled himself and it was to, to be an example of no matter what your stature is, you can still help other people Man. serve them. You know, and I think that's why you and I are here is to help other people. It's to, to give them lessons in life or yeah. what have you, you know, it's, yeah. if it's to uh, lead a better life, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, I've done things on Facebook where like, I, and this has been a number of years back, but I would see these bands come through like Baltimore or whatever. And it was like, party, 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 party. I got nothing wrong with party and party as much as you want to. But the thing is, you know, these like little girls would be partying with the band and the guys are doing heroin and and then they get this little girl hooked on heroin and stuff like that, you know, and my post was like, look, if you have if you have a substance problem, you need someone to talk to or something, please call me. Here's my phone number. And I put it on Facebook, you know, and it's like because I, I want to be a positive influence and help you. I've had my problems, you know, you don't have to live there, man. You know, there's freedom. And, and that's pretty much what I sing about. And I don't preach to anybody at all, you know, but there's hope, man. There's hope. You know, you wake up every day and just be thankful for another day. And when those doubts come in, like, you're no good. You still stink. You'll never write a hit record. You this, and that, and that. It's like, um, I don't even listen to that stuff anymore because I know who's in charge, man. That's right. You know, and I know eventually where I'm headed. I got one goal, and that's to see my folks again. Right. You know what, Joe? There's there's people in this world that don't believe in God, and trying to go i guess the uh, the christian way of doing things witnessing to people i've done it and i've had doors slammed in my face and you know i don't want to don't push your religion on me that kind of thing you know what there was a lady who um had asked me to find her daughter for her who had run away and i found her and i got her back home wow. and then the next week I came by to ask if, if that little girl could, well, little girl, she was a teenager, if she could come to our children's church or our teenage church in our church. And this lady just with almost called me every name in the book. I don't want to hear it. I'm like, I helped you get your daughter back. So. Yeah. And I'm like, God, is, is that hatred that deep that even somebody that helped you, you you wouldn't be willing to spend a, a couple hours just hearing a good message you know i i understand it but i don't understand it but if we want to teach christian values without sh you know shoving religion down their throat yeah there's there's ways of doing it so uh you know yeah. we're we're the, supposed to be the messenger if people change their lives then that's it's not up to us anyway it's it's up to god and if they don't they don't yeah i mean i and i had some examples that were right in front of my face and i couldn't see it you know until i ripped that person up it's called them every name in the book told them to get the app away from me don't ever this and, that, and then 
all of a sudden I hear that, you know, well, yeah, I, you know, I knew that you were going to treat him that way, but I sent him. You just have this feeling of like, oh, my God, you know, I'm such an idiot. You know, there's so much more to life. You know, what am I doing, you know? And I think that you have to reach that point. Once you've reached that point, everything changes. Now you're on a different path. And so you gotta you gotta water that path every day, you know. You gotta you gotta work on it, you know. Mm -hmm. I have people that have done me really some nasty stuff in my past, you know. And the thing is where it says don't judge, with the measure you judge, you're gonna be judged. Mm -hmm. If somebody did you wrong in the past and you still hate that, right? You ha you have judged that person. You you have become the judge. There's no way out of it. The only way out of it is forgiveness. Hey, whatever that person did to me, it's over. And if I can do anything for them, that's how I'll prove that it's over. Right? Yeah. And to me, that's that's the way that you have to look at it because everything else is black and white. It's love or hate. Our purpose is to hate the sin but love the sinner yeah yeah uh, i have people in my life that uh, i love dearly some really really close friends people i call brother um, yeah. i would die for yeah but i have to love them from afar because they can't stop partying and you know pouring around and not yeah. all those kind of things yeah. and yeah. i've i'm still there for them if they need me but they're not really in my inner circle anymore yes yeah. if i'm going to to grow you know as a man as yeah. a human being um, spiritually yeah i can't be around that stuff because so i know me i i haven't done cocaine and i can't tell you how long yeah but if i walked into a room and i saw it lined up on the table i don't know if i'd be able to resist it so yeah. i have to stay away from it yeah yeah so well, i get you you know one thing about being on the road um maybe i shouldn't say this but it didn't matter who we were opening for or if we were headlining or whatever backstage there was a food lots of food and there were lines of coke yeah and like you know like if we're going on be if we're opening for sticks if and i'm not saying that i have any knowledge just if they're all doing coke like everybody else is and we're not well what's our alternative well let's drink 20 cups of coffee yeah, but that won't work because we're going to have to pee the whole time we're on stage. Mm -hmm. So we would line up and do it, right? And so, like, I have base students that are like 19, 20 years old that I know are going to be make an impact. Mm -hmm. right? A lot of our lessons are about, do you know what to expect when you get out there? <laughs> you know, do you, you know what's going to happen? And I tell them what's going to happen, and this is the only way you're going to remain sane out there because it's all competition. It's all cutthroat. It's all competition. Musicians are some of the nicest people in the world. You know, I, I remember the first gig we did with Getty, with uh, Rush was in a theater in you know, PA somewhere, Reading, PA or somewhere. And we're doing our sound check, and... After the sound check, I pulled my cable out, and I had a Rickenbacker at the time, and walked around the, cor the corner of the curtain, and all theaters have like a brick wall in the back with a bench up against it. I come around the corner, and Getty and Alex are sitting there, and Getty goes, hey, man, sounds great. Love the record. And I was like, I didn't know, even know who they were. Like, I mean, I knew Rush, but I think 2112 had just been out, had just come out and stuff. And, and, uh, 
you know, there again, the best musicians were the most complimentary and the nicest people, you know, and, and it's, just, it's just the way it was. And then the people that were like afraid you were going to like blow them off the stage because of some history that they've heard, um, you know, give them, give them three quarters of the, of the power on the sound system and three quarters of the lighting, you know, well, I mean, that has an impact, you know, yeah. I want to be as loud as that last band and have the same amount of lighting as that last band or, you know, so anytime anyone opened for us, it was like hundred percent, everything, man. If you're going to blow us off the stage, go for it. And if you can do it then congratulations, but we're coming for bear, man. You know, we, we didn't slack around crack the sky. We did not slack around the bigger, the artists we were with, the harder we went for it, man. You it's know, it should be a friendly competition though. It was, it always was right. You know, now we had one situation where there was a band. Our first album was written half on a piano and half from guitar. Right? Mm -hmm. So on stage, we had a little Wurlitzer piano, but it was just so that we could do the songs. So we're, they're setting up and I'm back at my amp and I hear, ah, uh, you can't have a keyboard on stage here. Oh, yeah. And our road manager comes walking up and he's from, uh, he's from uh, Morristown, New Jersey, right? Jersey. Jersey. Uh, Jersey. Yeah, it was from <laughs> Jersey, man. And so he, he walks up and he goes, what, what, what's going on, Joe? And I said, I don't know. Somebody said something about a keyboard. He walks over and he goes to the, it's actually the keyboard player. He says, oh, well, what's the problem? He says, no, you can't have a keyboard on stage. Oh, we can't have a keyboard on stage. Well, we have one record out. It has 45 minutes uh, worth of music on it and half of it's from a keyboard. So what do you want us to do? I don't care what you do. You can't have a keyboard tonight. Walks over. The guy, the guy's keyboard is here. He's up against the wall. So if you're looking stage right, he's up against the wall facing this way. Our road manager walks up to him and says, oh, is that right? Well, let me tell you something. We're going to have a keyboard right in the middle of the stage tonight. Okay? And if you don't like it, then we're going to pack our stuff up. And you talk to the promoter about it grabs him by his neck and lifts him off the ground and says do you understand me and the guy's freaking out the guy's a star i won't tell you who the name is the guy's a star and i'm like just standing there like i don't want to have nothing to do with <laughs> none of this i don't know but that's the way it was sometimes you had to threaten somebody right? it sounds sounds like the manager but not don't know why I can't think of his name. The one from Led Zeppelin. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, boy, yeah. I can't think of his name to save my life, but. I know who you're talking about. It, yeah. I but, wouldn't say no to that guy at all. <laughs> uh -uh. You know, but uh, like there's, there's some, you know, cer certain things that I remember. Like, so I remember our first tour, we worked our way down the East Coast. And we get to Baltimore and like everybody knew every word to every song and the Brubeck brothers were opening for us, right? Dave Brubeck's sons and they were like badass, really good musicians. And I'm standing there watching them with the promoter and I was like, why are we going on after them? They're killer. And, he, and the guy goes, you don't know who you are. I was like, yeah, apparently not. We come down, there's people swinging from the chandeliers, like singing that we didn't even have to sing. It was just like the strangest thing. So we work our way down to New Orleans and, and uh, the CBS convention. So we played at CBS convention with Weather Report, Jocko did a solo, uh, Cheap Trick, Meatloaf. I bumped into Meatloaf, literally. Did you? Yeah, we were at a convention and he he actually bumped into me and I I looked up and I'm like, oh my God, it's meatloaf. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. But he lost a lot of weight. Yeah. Well, so Cheap, Cheap Trick was on the bill, right? So, and we had done dates with Cheap Trick. And so Robin and I were pretty good friends. And, you know, most of the guys, but Robin, I just liked him. I don't know there was something about him. And uh, here's what happened. So Meatloaf comes out and he's got his flowered shirt on, his tux and stuff, right? He comes out, the band starts playing, he comes out and he walks. Now, this is in the ballroom of the big hotel and it's all the CBS executives. So there's just round tables with chairs and a million white guys, right? He walks out and he walks onto the first table, picks up a beer, chugs it. You get some people start going, <sighs> Picks up another beer, chugs it, <gasps> moves to another table. Now he's a big guy and he walks over to this other table. Now he's standing on the table. He's chugging it. Before you knew it, the whole place is standing up, just cheering, right? So back in the 90s, I was managing a group from down here to Wheeling, West Virginia. And they won a Reverb Nation contest. So they got to play at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. Everyone was there. Uh, Marilyn Manson headlined. It was like John Bonham's son was there playing with Jason. Um, Jason was playing with uh, the singer that replaced uh, what's his name in Van Halen. Uh, You're Sammy talking Hager. about Sammy Hagar? Oh, yeah, Sammy yeah. Hagar. Uh, there were stages everywhere. Like there's like 10 stages where so anyway i'm back in the back in the uh, trailer and somebody comes back and goes hey uh what's the guitar player's name with all those strange guitar uh, uh anyway the there's a few of them because like steve Vai has some pretty crazy ones no nah, this was uh the you know the guy who would throw the picks and he had the like five necks on his guitar and the hat he wrote all the songs for cheap trick and everything, whatever he oh oh you uh, okay I, I i thought you yeah, were talking about yeah. somebody else but i know who you're talking about and uh, yeah, I, yeah yeah it's like rick nielsen rick, rick nielsen, nielsen yeah i got my crack the sky t-shirt on so they got rick nielsen's out there so i start walking out. he's talking to a guy and he looks over at me and goes what are you doing here i said well the band that i'm managing won this there was only one winner and they ended up on your stage. So we're, we're opening for you guys. And, uh, we talked for a while, went back, come back out. They said, uh, Robin's out there. I look out, he's got his dream police outfit on, right? The white, the whole white outfit. So I come out and I'm walking towards him and he looks at me and he goes, Joe. And I went, geez, it's been so many years. How do you remember my name? He went, I got a photographic memory. Don't tell anybody. I said, <laughs> oh, okay. First things first. I said, take the hat off. Cause remember he had that nice flowing blonde hair. I'm thinking now he's bald and he's wearing that hat and I'm going to bust him. I said, take the hat off. He took the hat off and he still had all his hair. And I, oh, okay. You still got all your <laughs> and I, so I said, I said, man, do you remember the meatloaf thing? Do you remember how meatloaf, that thing broke him, man. That's how that, you know, he, it, he got so, so popular with, you know, with doing the drinks on, on the tables. And uh, Robin said, you don't know the rest of the story. I said, well, what rest of the story could, could there be? He went, after that, he signed with our management agency. Okay, mm -hmm. they're in Chicago, right? So the agency, they have him opening for us. And, and Robin said, you know, and it was, they were on from the outskirts of Chicago, but Chicago was their home and they, they got big crowds. He says, so Meatloaf comes out and he opens for us and he gets booed off the stage. I was no. like, seriously, he was like, gets booed off the stage, goes, to the management and says, I'm never opening for anyone ever again. If you don't want. He's want not an opening me. act anyway. No, but he, he made a very smart decision right there. He said, I'm not doing it. And 
Robin said, and then he became famous. So that's the end of the story. <laughs> and I was like, well, thanks for up, updating me on that and stuff. You know? <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, you get to run into people that you haven't seen, like my the guy on the Bullet Train album that sang most of the lead has been Billy Joel's background singer for like 30 years. Oh, wow. Pete Hewlett from Pittsburgh. And he's a good friend of B.E. Taylor's. Then became a good friend of mine. And like, we keep in touch and, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of guys around here that have done some really big stuff, you know, but it's like anywhere else, you know, it's that everyone's got their own little camp and stuff like that. And, you know, as much as I like to record and do stuff, I just figured I got to start writing songs so I have something to put cool bass lines to because I really, really love doing it. So that that's why I started writing, you know, never nice. really saw myself as a songwriter, but um, uh, I kind of do now. Uh, I can enjoy it. I can see you as being a songwriter listening to this album. <laughs> It's, oh, it's good from beginning to the end uh, you know and the thanks, the last song what is it the uh the dark, dark sky, sky scene sea, yeah it is but you picked it to be in the perfect spot right there at the end because it seems like it closes out the whole album yeah i wrote that during the bullet train album and the bullet train album was more of a blues record and i thought you know this doesn't fit on that record so I just start writing like i don't think okay i'm gonna write this prog record and so the only thing i really thought was i want to really have some cool bass parts in here and stuff because i'm a bass player primarily and uh you know so i just figured well you know, i'm just gonna have to write and you know and that and i come up with something every day you know i have it's me and my dog <laughs> he's here and it, he can tell in the melody of my voice like as long as i'm talking and stuff he knows that daddy's working as soon as he hears the melody in my voice and i won't do it now because he'll jump on my lap is like uh kind of thanks a lot yeah good seeing you <laughs> boom man he's right on top of me but you know it's like we're just here all, all the all the time um our family has is involved in pizza there's like some kind of world famous pizza that started after you know, grandfathers came back from the war and stuff like that. So my wife works there oh, until cool. like nine o'clock every day. So I'm basically here, you know, and it, I don't like to sing and make a lot of noise, you know, when other people are around because I'll try stuff. You can always erase stuff, you know, so you might as well try anything, you know. Yeah. So, so yeah, I've the way i felt when i would draw or paint i didn't want anybody around me yeah so if i made a mistake i could fix it and nobody's seen it exactly and as soon as yeah. somebody walks in the door I'm, i cover everything up and i'm done <laughs> that's me too i get it man yeah, yeah but, uh, i miss that i, yeah. I kind of after the nerve damage i just kind of gave it up yeah but that dark sky see that's where that's where i was going that I wrote it during that that bullet train record, and then when it came to this record, I was like, you know, if you listen to the lyrics to it, it's one of those songs. It's like watching your friends go, go over the cliff, and, mm. and like you know, in slow motion, you're kind of like reaching for them, and you you, you kind of seem like you have the answer, and you're trying, and they just falling into the dark sky sea you know it's like at night when you look at the sea and you can see the moon over top of it and stuff there's something, something really cool about that you know but at the same time when you think about it the bottom of the ocean is a dark place man yeah. it's kind of like you know where do you want to live man like i don't want to live down there you know like i'm unique and i accept that you know, my creator made me different, you know, and all of my friends, some, some of them think I'm crazy this way, stupid this way, whatever, whatever, but you got to accept yourself at some point too, you know, with all your faults and everything, you know, it's like, this is who I am, you know, 
I'm sorry if I offended you, you know, if, if you don't like me and this and that and the other thing, but, you know, that's totally up to you, you know. I, you know, I'm not looking for confrontation. I, you know, on Facebook anymore, it's like, you know, I used to put up, good morning, it's a great day anytime your feet hit the ground, you know, or something like that. These days, if you post something like that, it'll be like, what's so great about it? Yeah. You know, you know it's like, it's, it's, there's not a lot of optimism. Uh, <laughs> I put up a, a video on YouTube. You know, they encourage you to make these real short videos to kind of compete with TikTok. Yeah. And I put up a clip of an interview I did with someone and it I want to say they had uh, tried to end themselves or something, or they had that feeling and they had how they had overcome it. And, you know, you think you'd get a positive response from something like that. Oh, this person's, you know, but yeah, I got these down votes on it and I'm going, why would you downvote something positive like that? Yeah, I don't know. Each his own. <laughs> a lot of cynics out there, a lot of people that, that just don't want to believe in anything. Um, you know, I, do you know who Joel Osteen is? Yes, I do. Okay, he's one of the most ripped up people on Facebook. He called me once when I was in Texas and, and you know, because I had done a lot of film work and translation work and all that stuff, you know, and asked me about uh, doing um, some work for him and stuff. And I visited them and this and that and the other thing. And then I was in New York for a, an audio engineering convention. I mean, my wife from walking through Rockefeller Center and there, and he's coming through with his wife. I was like, what are you doing here? What? So we kind of hung out for a while. And the only thing that I know about him is he's one of the nicest most genuine people that I've ever met and whatever these stories are and however this stuff is painted I don't even care you know because I don't believe any of it you know because I, I kind of know the guy's heart so I have friends that like the strangest people you know that I've I've met and I count it all blessings you know because every everyone I met like some of the biggest stars in the world were willing to talk to me, you know, it's like, I'm on a stage and here comes out of the blue, here comes the spaceship and it lands on stage. And I'm in the back of the stage. Nobody can see me, right? Cause it's not an arena. This is a flat floor and the stage is up here. So they're looking up and I'm sitting there. And then Jeff Lynn walks out of the spaceship and I'm thinking, what am I doing here? I don't belong here. The, I'm Joe from Steubenville. I'm not some big show. I'm this guy. Look, what am I doing here? We work our way down. I told you we did the CBS convention. We work our way across the southern states. Did Ted Nugent at the C uh, Santa Monica Civic Center and then went to Hawaii and did a concert at the arena there. Right At the end of the concert, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I'll, I'll tell you. So we're in Hawaii. We're in the locker rooms getting changed after the show. I'm drenched. This guy comes down with a Hobbit pipe. <laughs> I was a big Hobbit fan. I, I read the trilogy and everything. It's first he's got this book I ever read. With him, and the girl's got a dress down to the floor. And, hey, you guys want to smoke some pot? And I'm like, well, we're in Hawaii, man. Whatever. Go ahead. So take a couple of hits. The guy that one of the guys in the band, I looked over and he went, Mac, I'm really scared. And I realized at that point that I was scared too. So I went up in the balcony, right? And they're tearing down the equipment and they're playing uh, Jackson Brown. Stay just a little yeah, bit longer, longer if the roadies don't mind. And the roadies are playing it and all that. And then. And I'm up in the balcony, just sitting there overlooking them, tearing down the stage and stuff like that. <clears throat> and the song comes on all alone at the end of an evening 
where the bright lights are fading. fading. You know, I was thinking about the woman I love that I never knew. It hit me. It's like, I'm Joe from Steubenville. Like, how could this be happening to me? You know, and I always felt that way. And like, when I tell stories, uh, there's one story at the CBS convention where uh, after we were done playing, well, I got to meet Jocko. Anyway, but the, I go, I take a shower after we're done. I get on the elevator and I'm going to the penthouse for the big party, right? Mm -hmm. and this is like everybody's there, the, every big show. So I'm on the elevator, going to the penthouse. The elevator stops. Billy Joel walks on the elevator. What? I'm telling, okay, just the way you are, just the, I love you just the just way, the way you, are, you are, was just hitting gigantic then. And back then I had curly hair and we kind of looked a bit alike and Rick would always introduce me as, and on bass, Joe, I love you just the way you are, Macri, <laughs> right? And he would always say that. So anyway, Billy Joel gets on the elevator, he stands here and I got the controls here. And he looks over and he can see where it's going. And I, I'm not letting this go. I am not letting this go. So I looked at him and I went, man, I'll bet a lot of people were mistaking you for me tonight, huh? And he laughed and he said, let's go have some fun. We go up to the penthouse and I become his brother for the next two, three hours, right? He introduced me to everybody up there. He was just goofing all of them. I'm standing next to him the whole time. He wants me next to him the whole time. I think it was so that he could have something else to talk about, you know, instead of his record and like all the, everything was going on. It was like, Hey, do you mean my brother is Joey? Yeah. Da, 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 da. Went the whole night and got to meet everybody. And then at the end, he stand there with this woman and I walk up and he goes to her. Do you know who this is? And she looks at me and goes, no. And I went, I'm his brother, Joey. And he went, it's my wife, Elizabeth. So uh, he eventually nailed me, which is got you. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, some of those times, like, you know, it would hit you like, I don't belong here, man. <clears throat> like, this is me. I don't belong here. What am I doing here? You know? And, it, yeah. and that was always real exciting for me, you know? Cause like you could never convince yourself, well, I I'm good enough, man. I, I can hang with these guys, you know, but what I end up teaching my students now is like, when you get on the road, I don't care who you're opening for. You are the man. And if you don't believe it, ain't nobody out there going to believe it either. So I don't care. You know, I mean, we open for Getty a lot of times and I was totally, that has been cool. Holy cow, you know? And, uh, but I never went into a show thinking, man, I'm just, you know, I, I put so much into it. It was like, yeah, Getty's here, but you're going to remember me tonight. You're going to remember that I was here, you know? And I still feel that, you know, it's like, what, you know, I got enough sleep, you know, I did everything that I could so that I, I was, you know, could play those shows with confidence and stuff like that. And it was never, you know, now I never opened for yes. And I think at that point I probably would have been a little freaked out. With Chris <laughs> Mark. But, uh, you know, it's, it, it's just having the, having the kind of success that I had was perfect for me. Like I didn't need a lot. I didn't. And I know that if I had made a truckload of money from a hit song, I'd have just gone down the tubes. I don't. I don't think I would still be alive today. You wouldn't be here talking to me right now, I'm making my day. <laughs> we would be carrying on for a while here. <laughs> they, no, so, you, you, do you remember when you were talking about being there where Rocky was filmed? Yeah, yeah. It, it's as if y'all are kind of like Rocky. You went. You go out there and and you fight with everything you've got, and eventually, you know, you won. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The first one, it, he lost, but he didn't lose. 
You know what right. I mean? I've watched those movies. I'll still some they'll, they'll be on like Labor Day or Memorial Day or something like that, and they'll have every. I'll sit there and watch all of them. I can't stop. Um, One I of my saw top ten. Frank, Frank Stallone on Instagram, and I said, "Hey, Frank, listen, uh, he doesn't know me from nothing." Uh, if we get out on the road, hopefully I'm going to take my record on the road. Would you know? I'd love for you to come and sit in with us and stuff like that. He makes guitars and all that, you know. And Sylvester's always on there. But my dad's first name was Sylvester, so when I went to see Rocky the first time, it's like this little theater in the village, and it was kind of a test test market thing. At the end, everyone stood up, standing ovation. It's one of those. So. After seeing the film and then being in the spectrum, you know, it was kind of my Rocky moment. And, and we, you know, it was Blue Oyster Cult, man. It was like six groups. They gave us 20, 25 minutes. And we ended with I Am the Walrus. And 16,000 people stood up and screamed at us. And I could <laughs> feel it almost knocked me over um, because we, you know, said that one of the writers we we heard that one of the writers of this song is in the audience is here tonight chicka, 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 chicka. <laughs> so all the media wanted to talk to us where's john lennon i don't know didn't know nobody else got any any press that day uh, but back in those days You'd had to get the newspaper in the morning, oh. right? No internet, right? So you would see the review of your show. So I think it was in New Orleans, not the CBS convention, but someone. And I, I found this cool, you know, Chris Squire had the coolest outfits, right? I found this satin outfit and it was like purple here or, or kind of scarlet and gold. And then the pants were reversed and it had little bells on the end of the thing and little slippers with bells on the bottom and i was like i'm a rock star now man i got the i got the outfit i wore it that night and played next morning got up got the paper and read the review of the concert went through like yeah and this guy and that guy and that and tinkerbell on bass oh no oh my gosh i burned it i never wore it again i burned it (laughs) i don't blame you Tinkerbell. So that would have pissed me off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, it's it's just kind of you just kind of go along with it. It's like, you know, I'm comfortable where I'm at as a musician, an instructor. I teach Pro Tools and guitar and bass and keyboards, and whatever. And uh, I'm just comfortable with where I am now. You know, you get older, you get kind of get more comfortable. You know, and. Uh, you know, I, I'm just super thankful that I had any career at all, you know, and so it's it's all been good for me and it's still going and yeah. I don't have to live up to anybody's expectations. Some people think that I do, but I don't have to and I don't, you know, so I'm going to keep turning them out and uh, just keep on keeping on, man. I, I mean, if you do anything better than this, it's I, I don't know how it wouldn't be a, a top bit. You know, getting people to listen, man. That's the whole thing. That's just it, man. The stuff that that Billy sends me, I'm like, how are these guys not, you know, all over the the world? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you're just doing it for the art, and that's the best part of it. But then at some point, you want to get paid so that you can keep doing more of it. Right? Of course. <laughs> You could take your money and throw it in the river and say, oh, okay, I did something today, but it's it's not going to help anything, you know? Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's all good. It's all good with me. Um, uh, I love what I do. Um, you know, I'm, 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 if I were any happier, I would have to be two people. I don't yeah. know how else to put it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Is there somebody, how are you doing? I said, if I were doing any better, I'd have to be two people. You know, it's the only way I can answer. So, well, I can encourage you a little bit because apparently this there's a generation that's coming up, very young kids that are getting into the '70s and the '80s music, and they're they're 
walking away from the corporate stuff that's out there right now and going back to the old stuff. Now, I, I tend to believe it's true from the people that have told me that. Uh, I hope it's true. I was out uh, in uh, New Braunfels, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry, San Marcos on the river. There was college students out there with mullets. Mullets. <laughs> <laughs> but no, they, awesome. but the younger generation, like um, around my grandkids' age, are starting to listen to the older stuff. Yeah. And I think if they get introduced to to what you you've got, which is you know kind of a more modern take on that '70s sound. Yeah. I, th I think you might have a new audience there. Yeah, I think vinyls encourage that too. You know. Mm hmm young people are discovering vinyl and how it sounds and all that and so yeah you know uh, it's but w you know without that fm radio thing and everybody playing this you know this stuff you know the same everything songs. is right there at your fingertips nobody wants to listen to the radio anymore no no so you know you got youtube and man that's where i find a lot of really good artists you know, yeah like, gosh, some of these funk bands are unbelievable because the mm -hmm. players are so good now you know yep. but it's like i tell my students you know you you can be a really good guitar player and a really poor musician and so you got to make it make a choice you know on what you want to do you know you could learn jimmy page solos all day and play them exact but you'll never be jimmy page because he created them mm -hmm. so what you have to do is you have to learn how to create solos what am i playing why am i playing these notes you know yeah. and so that's what i try to get back with my students like teaching them to play is all well and good but getting them into music you know so it's got to come from in here too if it doesn't well, have totally. feeling it yeah. doesn't mean nothing yeah if yeah. i start playing something and i'm i'm not feeling it i'm gonna go get a cup of coffee you know, I'm going to like take a break and get my head in the right place. Yeah. You know, um, you know, who else is great at teaching that is uh, Rick Emmett from Triumph. Oh, yeah. We did some gigs with Triumph. Oh, no way. Yeah. That's a band I wished I'd been able to go see. Yeah. I think the drummer didn't the drummer Bill Moore. sing lead. He had the. Well, they did. Yeah. Him, and he sang a lot of the lead, but he traded off with Rick. Rick, yeah. Rick yeah, could yeah. hit those high notes. Oh my God, he could hit those high notes. If I'm, if my memory serves me correct, and I could be wrong, but I think they were headlining the Stanley Theater in Pittsburgh, and we were going to be their opening act. And so many of our family members came and stuff. And my grandmother was in the audience with her grandma sweater and rosary beads and stuff she was there <laughs> my my and, son <laughs> yeah yeah and they all had signs you know joe magri to do palumbo this and the other thing that i think ufo saw that and said can we open i'm almost sure it was them it could have been there was another band lights UFO out ufo or something i, I can't remember but uh, yeah, but uh, I, and then I remember playing with them. I think Texas was their home area, wasn't it? Who, who's that? Um, oh, you talking about Triumph? Triumph. They're they're from Canada. Oh, that's right. I've asked that question before. Yeah, for some reason I thought they were from Texas. Yeah, they should be, but you know, unfortunately, Canada. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And, I mean, Texas is the greatest place on earth. So. Yeah, I lived there almost 30 years, and our son's still there. My grandbabies are there and still love to go back. And uh, Come here. You need to. You need to get there and see him. I'll come, stop and visit you. <laughs> this is my inspiration, Mac, right here. Say What's hi. up, Mac? How you doing? Oh, what do you think, man? Can, can you tell the audience the uh, the Spinal Tap story? Oh, okay, yeah. So I did this meet and greet up in Baltimore 
couple months ago, and it was it was uh, the Crack the Sky fan fan club did it, and so I went out and played some songs on my new album and stuff like that. And when I got done, this guy from this TV station, who's a friend of mine, said, "Hey, did you meet so and so and his wife?" And we got to talking, and it turns out they have this big podcast, and as I was talking about something that the wife said, Oh, you'd be great for the podcast. And I'm like, podcast playing. Well, the deal is, um, I could find his name too. It's Patrick something or other. Um, he said, so yeah, their podcast is they take stars. Like could be like a NBA player, you know, an actor, just whatever. And they present them with a film that they had some connection to, but were not in the film. And so they said, do you have any films that like you were not in, but that you had a connection to? And I said, well, gee, I just watched that, uh, the offer, which is the making of the Godfather, but no, I don't have any connection there. And then it hit me, Spinal Tap. Spinal Tap was pretty much about us. It was like, what? Well, the way it turns out, if you watch Spinal Tap, at the end it says, so and so, whoever Spinal Tap's manager was, is Derek Sutton. Derek Sutton was our manager, Styx and Robin Trower. Okay. So if you watch Spinal Tap, I told the guy, I said, you know, so like Spinal Tap, do you remember when they got lost and couldn't find the stage and there was like pipes and tubes and they're trying to get up to the stage? That was us, and Derek was with us, and, and I think it was at Cobo Hall in Detroit. Uh, and, and I told him, and they were like, S "Are you serious?" I was like, "Yeah." And then you know, well, you know, these guitars, uh, these amps go up to eleven. Right? I said, well, "That's Robin Trower, right?" And then the thing with uh, sticks were always like theatrical, right? They always had this kind of theatrical side to them. And so the thing with them coming up out of the ground in those tubes and the yeah, bass they player gets stuck. Couldn't get it. <laughs> right? I didn't see that, but I'm sure this has to be a stick story, right? So anyway, you know, they're like, oh, you'd be great for the podcast. Well, then, you know, a couple months, two, three months go by. I don't hear anything from them thinking, why well, you know, they got more important people to deal with. And, uh, and I got a message from the guy on Twitter. And he says, hey, you still want to do that uh, interview, that podcast? And it's like supposed to be this big podcast. I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll tell you. know, But I have to watch Spinal Tap again to see it, you know, so I could write down all, all the parts that were actually us, right? Man, I want to go watch it again. Yeah, I got to find it. I don't know where it's streaming, but I got all the streaming service ever since COVID. Yeah. Just like, yeah. I got the DVD. Uh, but I, I think you can get it on Amazon Prime, and but I don't know how much it costs. So to buy guess, the DVD. Yeah, well, I mean, you can get am on Amazon Prime, and you can either rent or buy it digitally. But I totally do not recommend that you buy any movies online because they'll take that digital away from you. I used to have Deadpool on digital, and it. I can't get on it no more. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow. You know, that uh, was like 20 bucks, I think. Yeah, and I have Amazon <laughs> Prime. I, I watch a lot of documentaries anymore these days. You have, know, you, like, have you seen the one about uh, Zappa? No. I, I, I was going to hit play on it, but I had a couple other priorities. But I, I, I might watch that one tonight. Billy's in it. He is? Yes. Billy James is in it. That's how oh. that's why I, I uh got in touch with him in the first place. But they were talking about the, the mothers of invention and Billy was being interviewed because he wrote a biography about the mothers of invention. And being Zappa nut, and I saw this, I'm like, I've got to look this guy up. So I found out that he owned a PR firm and I messaged him. I'm like, I, I saw you on the, the Zappa documentary. I'm a huge fan. 
but you know, you wrote a book about him. I'd really love to have you on my show and talk about it. And Billy answered me. He says, look, man, I, I don't have the equipment right now. He says, I, I'm really, really busy. But he says, if, if you don't mind, I have some uh, people that I represent that I would love to get on your show. Well, I figured these were going to be just people getting into the business that needed the, the publicity, right? Yeah. Sends me uh, Kevin Godley, who was the drummer of 10CC, also in Godley and Cream. Um, let's see, who else is sending me? Uh, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Brain fart time. Um, well, he sent me some other names that we haven't connected with yet, but it was like Carmen Apathy and, you know, all these other people. I'm like, are you kidding? Of course, I would love to have them on my show. In fact, uh, that's how I met Jeff Cotton was through Billy James, and yeah. um, he he's eventually going to help me get some of the remaining uh, members from the Zappa from the Mothers of Invention. Hopefully, hopefully, and I really want to get him on my show to talk about the book and all that he does. But man, it, it's been such a blessing meeting him yeah. because everybody that's been on my show we've connected in some way and yeah. for some of them to uh say hey you know call me up um you know hey if i get to austin i want to meet up with you and you know let's go just go eat somewhere or something yeah. or, you know um if i'm if i need some spiritual guidance i could call some of them and say hey man i'm feeling down today yeah. and i'm i'm not feeling as close to god and yeah they'll pray with me and yeah i mean it's been such a blessing and yeah. all the music has been incredible that's awesome yeah now one thing i'll tell you is if our first gig with zappa was in largo maryland at the capitol center <clears throat> and since we were big in baltimore kind of in dc and i guess it's right in between those two um I'm like, oh my God, we're gonna open open for Zappa. This is cool. Well, Terry Bozio was playing drums. Patrick, I forget his last name, was playing bass. They were like incredible. They're reading everything. Everything's charted out, and they're reading this stuff that Frank wrote. Yeah, they so, had to be the best of the best to play they with Frank. Did. And and uh, uh, typically, when you're on the road with someone, if you get along, like whenever I got along with a bass player and we're doing a number of cities, we'd get together in the hotel room and I'd be on one bed, they'd be on the other bed with our bases not plugged in. And we would just do finger exercise. Check this out because you make up these strange things that are hard to play. And then you get, they get easier to play and it kind of helps your, it kind of helps you, you know? Right. So I'm like, well, here's this and, oh that's cool check this out so we trade licks with with each other and stuff and uh and, and that was cool but i remember going up we get on stage packed house and we start i even remember that it was called wet teenager we started with with that song and i happened to look up and remember the jumbotrons my face was on the whole jumbotron. Wow. I it freaked me out. I was like, what am I supposed to do? I never, I never had not thought about this. Am I supposed to look at it? <laughs> it was like, what? it's me. It's Joe from Steubenville. What? I'm on the, the jumbotron in DC. This, <laughs> there's something weird about this. Uh, but, uh, and then they, then they gave us the, hotel i think it was in erie we did at the erie field house some gigs and frank would just drink coffee but they would always close the holiday inn or wherever it was they would close down the bar and let us have a bar oh that's cool remember, yeah and i remember frank came in one day with a cup of coffee and he sat at the bar and there was this young girl and she was waiting on all of us she's real nice and i got three sisters I remember him starting to make some strange comments 
too. When didn't he? <laughs> yeah, and then he actually put her up on the bar, and she was sitting there, and he was like doing something, and I just remember thinking like, this is not cool. If this was one of my sisters, like, you know, I would not like this. And I remember walking up and standing between him and her. Just walked up and now I'm standing there thinking, and are you actually going to get into a fist fight with Frank Zappa? What the heck are you doing? <laughs> right? I don't know. I was that would have be been something. a story. <laughs> yeah, you know it. I don't think he was. I, I just, I, but I think I did kind of disrupt whatever was going on or something. I don't know. But it, it, I'm sure he was genius, nicest guy in the world. But he was kind of off by himself all the time. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I, I know he would, from what I've read, he kind of went off on his own when he wanted to create. The, yeah. I mean, he, if he needed a certain sound and it didn't matter how long you've been in the band, if somebody else could give him the sound he was looking for, you were out and the next guy was in. And you had to read it. You had to read mm -hmm. all of that. You know, when we first got to New York, it was like, so we have a per diem. We started doing sessions, became a session player, you know, and it was like at that point, my sight reading had to be really good. Mm hmm. You know, and in bands, you, you're not sight reading. You know what I mean? Zappa was an oddity in that area. You know, it's like those guys played everything that he wrote. Yeah. The, nobody, I, mean, I think, ever got parts, everything. Nobody right. got as complex as he did. No. He, nobody. He was just a monster. But, uh, I mean, but yeah, it just all of those experiences, I wouldn't trade them for anything. You know, blame you. I mean, it was, just, it was just like, it's me. What, what am I doing here? I, I don't So when I tell stories like that on Facebook, like one time I told the story about the bit spending the evening with Billy Joel, you know, it was mm -hmm. like people were like, you need to write a book, man. You, need to you should. I don't have enough time. Well, so what, what I'm going to do is I've, I started doing blogs on my uh, uh, joemacri.com, my, my, my website. And you know, I'm like typing all this and I think, you know what, I'm just going to do it on Zoom, just me talking into the camera, tell the story. And if it needs to be transcribed someday and I can put a collection of these stories and make a book of it, that's great. But just to sit down, do the outline of the book. I started one and it was like a novel about a guy in the music business and it was really about Crack the Sky. And then I thought, you know what, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. Well, rehash. I, 